Hello, hello and welcome. Um, welcome to the UQ Art Museum for this inaugural Leonardo ISAS laser talk in Australia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet, the Turbul Yagara people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. My name is Grayson Cook, and with my great friend and colleague, Elizabeth Stevens, I'm overjoyed, excited, very pleased to welcome you to what is the first in a series of talks that we'll be convening um, with the support of Leonardo and the International Society for the Arts, Sciences and Technology. So you're here at a laser talk. Laser is an acronym. Um, it might be a metaphor. Maybe these talks are about highly directed, attentional, focused uh, discussion getting cut through, but in fact, it is an acronym. Um, Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous. Um, tonight's talk is part of an international program of gatherings that bring artists, scientists, other scholars and the public together for presentations, performances and conversations. The mission of LASER is to encourage contribution to the cultural environment of a region by fostering interdisciplinary dialogue and opportunities for community building. We want to extend our enormous thanks to the Leonardo LASER team for supporting our application to become the first Australian site for these talks. Both Elizabeth and I have been avid fans, readers, authors and referees for Leonardo for many years. So we're just overjoyed that we get to expand our engagement in this manner with the remarkable institution that is Leonardo. We want to thank the UQ Art Museum for hosting tonight's event. We also thank our respective institutions, the University of Queensland and Southern Cross University, as well as the Australian Research Council for supporting the event. A special thanks to John Edmonds for his incredible organisational work um, in bringing this event to life. I'd also like to thank ANAT, the Australian Network for Art and Technology, for their promotional support, for their auspicing of a vibrant art science scene in Australia, and for championing the wonderful work of tonight's guests. Which brings me to the end of my spiel, and it's with great pleasure that I'd like to pass over to Elizabeth Stevens to introduce, introduce our guests and begin the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Grayson. Well, welcome everyone. What a treat it is to actually be welcoming people to a live event. It's been a long time since we've been able to do that. So it's really a delight to see, to see human faces in a room and not just behind a screen. So welcome to everyone who's joining us here in the room tonight and welcome to all of our friends and colleagues who are joining us um, on the stream of this um, event as well. I'd like to start by acknowledging too that we are meeting on the unceded land of the Yubur and Turrbal people and to pay my respects to elders past and present and to future generations. And I'd especially like to extend a warm welcome to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us here this evening. You might notice the um, wonderful image that we're standing in front of here. This is by one of the um, our wonderful local Indigenous artists here in Queensland, Tony Alberts as well. So you can continue to enjoy that as we're talking this evening. So when my good friend and colleague Grayson Cook invited me to, um, to join him in launching the first Leonardo Laser Talk series here in Australia, I really jumped at the opportunity um, to have the occasion to bring together um, a series of wonderful artists and scientists to talk about their collaborative projects and their issues um, of shared concern. Um, as some of you will know, this is in fact the subject of my ARC um, Future Fellowship, um, which examines collaboration between artists and scientists and I should say thank you to the ARC as well for supporting this event this evening. So I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to introduce our two speakers um, this evening who are both leading and important figures working across the apparent divide between the arts and sciences and this is reflected in the project that um, Grayson has already um, referenced, their ANAT Synapse Award, which they'll be talking um, about a little bit this evening. And I'm especially excited to introduce our 
first speaker this evening, who is joining us from Hobart uh, today. So it's a bit exciting to get someone in from out of town um, to join us at the moment. So let me begin by introducing Svenja Kratz. I first met Svenja Kratz um, back some time ago when she was doing her PhD in biotechnology and contemporary art at the Queensland University of Technology. And I've watched with great pleasure in the intervening years as she's become such a significant figure as a practitioner in the field of transdisciplinary creative arts practice, um, particularly working at the intersections between the sciences and arts. Her work includes The Absence of Alice, a series of exhibitions inspired by her engagement with the South True Bone Cancer Cell Line, and the Human Skin Experience Equivalent Project, a jewellery project involving tissue engineering practices. Svenja has exhibited her work at a range of national and international venues, too many for me to itemize here, and is currently based in Hobart, where she works as a lecturer in interdisciplinary creative practice within the fine arts discipline at the University of Tasmania School of Creative Arts and Media. So Svenja will talk first, and then after Svenja, she will, um, Dietmar Huttmacher, um, will join her to talk about his part of their collaboration. So I'll, I'll introduce Dietmar as well now, and then I will get off the podium. So Dietmar is one of the pioneers and world leaders in the field of biomaterial science and tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. He has a wide range of extremely high impact publications in this field, while also illustrating a real commitment to interdisciplinarity. And I think tonight is an example of that deep map. His research program works across and draws together a wide range of disciplines, including science and engineering, and within this, bioengineering, biomaterial science, computational modeling, chemistry and nanotechnology as well as the life science dip disciplines, incorporating molecular and cell biology, stem cell research, genomics and bioinformatics, and clinical research, including orthopedics, plastic and reconstructive surgery, and radiology. He's one of the few academics who has successfully um, translated a tissue engineering research program um, from fundamental research into routine clinical application. We are so lucky to have these amazing speakers joining us here tonight to talk about their work. So please join me in welcoming to the podium, Svenja Kratz. So thanks um, so much. Um, before I begin, I'd also just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm presenting today, the Turrbal and Yegara peoples, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'd also just like to take a moment to thank Elizabeth Stevens and Grayson Cook for inviting me to speak today. As a longtime follower of Leonardo and the associated laser talk series, it is a great privilege to be invited as one of the speakers to launch the inaugural laser um, Australian series at UQ. It is also wonderful to have the opportunity to discuss collaborative work that I have developed with project partners, including of course, um, distinguished professor Dietmar Hutmacher. Um, and I'll begin my presentation. I'll just see if that will over, excellent, um, with an introduction to cell and tissue culture to provide some initial context for the, um, for the, the talk and the project, alongside some precursor works that give insight into my practice and the foundations of our current project, the Post-Human Genetic Legacies um, Project, which is, um, as already outlined, part of the 2021 ANAT Synapse Program and currently in development across the School of Creative Creative Arts and Media, the Centre for Law and Genetics, and the School of Medicine at UTAS, and of course also the Centre for Regenerative Medicine at QUT with DIPMA. So this project, as you'll come to see, aims to create an alternative genetic legacy via the immortalization from my, of cells from my tissue. And over the next 20 minutes or so, I hope to track some of the key moments that led to the project's conceptualization and will maybe make you think that the project is less weird, <laughs> all right? So for audience members unfamiliar with my practice, I started my foray into the world of art and science during my PhD, which I undertook, as Elizabeth mentioned, across visual art and biotechnology at QT. 
And I was really, really fortunate to have supervisors from both disciplinary terrains. And even though I was an artist, I was actively integrated into the then tissue repair and regeneration group within the Institute of Health and Biomedical Innovation and trained to actually undertake cell and tissue culture myself. So the first flask of cells that I received um, were SAUS2 cells, which you, where the SAUS2 um, title references their origin as sarcoma osteogenic. So a bone cancer cell line, which was established in the 1970s from an 11 year old girl I called Alice. So these cells as shown on the slide are typically grown in a single layer on the base of a tissue culture flask within a liquid nutrient medium. Cell lines like SARS-2 cells are considered immortal because unlike healthy cells that have an inbuilt mechanism to prohibit ongoing replication and thus avoid errors creeping in, which is dubbed the Hayflick limit, they can divide almost indefinitely. As such, they can continue to grow and be split as you'll sort of see on that slide there into more and more tissue culture flasks as they fill up the available space, a process called passaging. So this allows vast quantities of cells to be produced and the total biomass of many common cell lines now vastly outweigh the bodies from which they originated. Indeed, as, a cell, as um, tissue culture and art pioneer Oren Katz often points out, the first immortal, immortal human cell line, the HeLa cell line, a cervical cancer cell line created in 1951, or but without the um, patient's consent, could likely fill this entire area, this entire building, and then some, with an estimated biomass as documented in the book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, at 50 million metric tons. I'll just let that sink in for a moment. So the cell line HEC293, for um, while some cells like the HeLa cell, which I've just talked about, are naturally immortal due to the genetic mutation that rendered them cancer cells, Healthy cells can also be transformed into immortal cell lines through the exposure to chemicals or the introduction of viral DNA that disrupts replicative senescence or disrupts the stop switch for cell replication. So the cell line HEC293, which you'll see on this next slide, for example, is an artificially immortalized cell line, which was again established in the 1970s, but from the tissue of an aborted fetus. Indeed, the title HEC refers to the cell line's origins, although now somewhat questionably as human embryonic kidney cells. The number 293 documents the number of experiments that were required to immortalize the cells, which was done using sheared adenovirus 5 DNA. To date, HEC 293 um, cells have spawned at least 12 daughter cell lines, which were catalogued by researchers in 2018. So this includes the common HEC 293 T variant. Um, and here the T signals a further alteration to the cells through the incorporation of the simian virus 40 large T antigen, um, which basically just refers to a specific protein from an animal virus. And the addition of that particular protein renders the cell line easier to transfect. So to introduce additional genetic material, so RNA or DNA into the cell. So indeed, during a residency at Symbiotica, which is a leading art science lab at UWA in Perth, I was really easily able to introduce green and red fluorescent proteins, which are derived from marine invertebrates such as jellyfish into 293T cells. So despite this being a really routine process, what really struck me about work working with HEC 293T cells was how an organism that never really reached full gestation could nonetheless result in a whole series of unique microorganisms with different traits that are in a sense primed for further modification, drawing attention to the ever present but increasingly porous nature of taxonomic, taxonomic distinctions. In the context of immortal cells, it is also worth noting that despite, that despite the implied constancy that the term immortal implies, even without further modification, cells in themselves, the cell lines in themselves are not static, but dynamic entities that are highly responsive to different culture conditions, such as changes in media or temperature. 
Furthermore, the longer that the cells are cultured, the more they change, becoming arguably ever different from the original donor cells. That is why lower passage number or cells that have not been um, doubled and split so many times are preferred for research because they have less chance of alteration or mutation. So phenotype or genotype changes and the cells thus express characteristics that are more in line with the original cell line. As such to me, cell lines occupy a strange in between territory operating as living and evolving remnants of an absent body. They remain intimately connected to the original donor via DNA, yet as cancer or transformed cells separated and living in a laboratory environment, they are fundamentally different from their healthy counterparts and can be regarded as Oren Katz and Yonat Zer from Symbiotica assert as semi-living entities and a new class of bioengineered life. In returning to creative practice, these reflections were translated into the development of a large series of interrelated works under the collective title, The Absence of Alice, that commented on the origins um, and uncanny nature of both the SARS-2 and also the HEC cell line, but also foregrounded notions of transformation and the potential of biotechnologies to create new forms of life through technological and interspecies couplings. Moving forward, in 2015, I was fortunate to collaborate with Dittmar and his regenerative medicine team on an art science project titled Biosynthetic Systems. Funded by a Creative Sparks grant from the Brisbane City Council, the project aimed to explore, explore the possibilities of biofabrication. So the use of 3D to printing technologies for regenerative medical applications, such as bone and tissue repair. And as you can see on this slide, the group has a strong track record of translation of lab research to clinical application, such as designing customized biodegradable scaffolds for correct, correcting tissue and bone mal malformations. So this example here shows a young woman who was fitted with a custom made scaffold to correct a birth defect that had left her with a sunken chest. The scaffold was implanted along with the patient's own fat cells. And as they proliferate through the structure, the scaffold will eventually dissolve, leaving the patient's own tissue in place. And on this slide, you can see some additional biofabrication examples, including electro spinning, which enables the creation of really fine filaments that look a little bit like spider silk. And of course, 3D printing that enables the development of replacement bone structures, but also strength testing for bone scaffolds. And I'm sure Dittmar will provide some more interesting insights. So initially the project was pitched as an investigation into the ethical implications of developing living products with the plan to create a sculptural bioreactor to showcase a living custom sculpture with a digital representation of its aliveness via a holographic projection. But as with many collaborative pro projects, these initial interests shifted in response to the research interests and insights of the larger project team, including Dittmar, of course, artist Bill Hart, and a range of experts from the Center for Regenerative Medicine to focus more on the concept of immortality through technological intervention. And this interest was spurred by the recognition that popular film and media representations of tissue, tissue engineering often suggest that 3D, 3D printed organs and replacement body parts are really, really close to realization. And that soon we will not only be able to repair and reshape the body, but eliminate death altogether through the development of bioengineered or robotic bodies coupled with a form of downloadable consciousness. So the idea of technological immortality is particularly evident in the views of transhumanists such as Ray Kurzweil and philosophically aligned projects such as the 2045 Avatar project initiated by Russian entrepreneur Dmitry Itzkov. As you can see on the slide, the 2045 project proposes the development of a series of progressive technological avatars from a robotic body controlled by a brain um, interface to a wholly holographic entity. There are, of course, a range of concerning issues that accompany this proposition, including, again, the positioning of the body as inherently flawed and technology regarded as superior. 
This is a rather baffling viewpoint when we consider rates of mechanical breakdown and the increasing rapid technological obsolescence we're all experiencing. It also suggests that in essence, biology can be reduced to binary code, privileging information over materiality, reinforcing the mind and body split and ignoring the myriad interspecies and embodied connections that make up our physical being. The, 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 regenerative, sorry, the regenerative medicine team also commented that the regenerative capabilities of the body are still regarded as superior to current technological equivalents, and that many clinical products in development at the center, such as the earlier example, are designed to harness the healing capacities of the body. To reiterate this point, the team is also working on custom biodegradable breast scaffolds for breast cancer survivors that are designed to dissolve as the patient's own cells permeate the structure, thus ultimately replacing the initial scaffold with human tissue. So through ongoing discussion and experimentation, the Biosynthetic Systems Project resulted in the development of a range of creative works and speculative prototypes that enabled us to be playful and test rather than fully resolve our ideas. So works as part of the project included a sculptural biomonument, um, which featured a mirror hologram of cell growth alongside live 3D printed structures created by mapping the growth and movement of cells on a custom electro, electro spun scaffold. And this work was developed to test the capabilities of the electro spinning system by integrating handwritten text, but also aimed to highlight the dynamic nature of the cells. The exhibition also included a writing machine, which was developed by Bill Hart, that replicated my handwriting and used, a pro used programmed neural networks to create an ongoing narrative that reflected on what it might be like to be an AI entity and the change from biological to technological. The work was also presented in conjunction with digital video works based on 3D scans of my face that operated as strange and fragmented digital avatars. Creative works were also displayed alongside technologies developed or used by the Centre of Regenerative Medicine, such as a 3D printing demo and series of scaffolds to provide insight into the current developments, but also the limitations of regenerative technologies and invite viewers to consider the potentials of the Centre's research, but also the philosophical implications of working with living systems and patients and the potential mergers of artificial life and biotechnology. The monument and writing machine prototypes that were developed initially during this phase were later refined for exhibition as part of the spare parts program at the Science Gallery in London. The writing machine retitled Ghostwriter included an expanded text archive, an interactive video avatar, and also a live microphone that would listen to the environment and trigger the machine to write in response to detected words or sounds. The monument was also re-envisioned to comment more directly on the human desire to control the elements and nature in order to find the secret to eternal life. As such, the monument incorporates a range of sigils composed of historical and alchemical sim symbols, such as the philosopher's stone, as well as references to the transhumanist movement. And you'll also see in the center, it features a central biaxial bioreactor showcasing a range of custom scaffolds in the shape of different body parts. Videos in the monument to immortality structure on the exterior also comment on the power of visual culture and influence of the media, science fiction and pop popular science imagery on public perceptions of technological progress. The pyramid housing at the top of the monument, for example, features a holographic video that references the concept of the soul or vital force, raising questions about how religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs fit into future projections of technological immortality and replacement bodies. In combination, the two works um, and different elements aim to really encourage viewers to contemplate their own position regarding engineered eternal life. So more recent work continues this interest in immortality, but with a shift, as I, that, which I've already alluded to, to the concept of continuance by the establishment of a genetic legacy. While this focus does build on earlier work, 
It is also responsive to my situation as a single woman in the later stages of reproductive viability. And over the last few years, I've really started to consider how I might be able to use biotechnologies to establish an alternative biological legacy beyond giving birth to human offspring, such as engineering off, um, other organisms such as bacteria, or more interestingly, but with um, much greater difficulty, tardigrades or hydra, because they are known for their relative indestructibility and to use them to host fragments of my DNA. And the first work to emerge from this initial proposition was titled Self-Portrait 2, Site of Infection, and it consisted of a wax cast of my bust, rendered in a style reminiscent of classical depictions of female deities that emitted vapour containing my DNA. The work drew on developments in genetic engineering and gene therapy, but also the significant presence of viral DNA, estimated at up to 8% in the human genome from ancestral retroviral infection. Indeed, I propose that rather just engineering bacteria or other organisms to host my DNA, my DNA, I could engineer viruses to infect and replicate fragments of my genetic code into a whole range of different organisms, including humans by using a retrovirus and targeting germ cells, so egg cells and sperm cells, it might even be possible for the selected DNA sequences to be then also passed on to the organism's offspring. In this way, I could pass on a portion of my genetic information without having much, any children of my own because other people, people like you and your children would be able to host and be, become hosts and continue to perpetuate a tiny portion of me in perpetuity. What an exciting proposition, right? <laughs> um, so the work was, as you can imagine, designed to be deliberately provocative and highlight the uncomfortability that many of us experience at the prospect of infection, especially now, and the work was developed pre-COVID, um, and the idea also of genetic contamination, despite my alignment to the post-human position that we are not so much individuals, but rather multi-species ecologies already comprised of shared and swapped genetic material. So most recently, and as part of our post-human genetic legacies project, my work has returned to cell and tissue culture, and particularly the prospect of establishing a series of immortalized cells, a bit like the hex cell variants from my own body via a range of processes, such as using viral genes to disrupt programmed cell senescence, but also to make the cells available for scientific and artistic use. Sorry, and so Cell immortalization is now a relatively common practice, and there are even companies that you can see on the slide that offer an immortalization service, um, although I'm hoping to do it myself. So in coming up with this idea, is it important to acknowledge that there is an artistic predecessor, the Billy Apple cell line, which was initiated by artist Craig Hilton in 2010. And while the project, the immortalization of Billy Apple, shares the aim to develop an artist cell line for use across artistic and scientific domains, the project, as you may gather from the registered name, was ultimately about preserving the artist's brand. In my case, the desire to produce my own cell line links to the previous self-portrait project discussed, but ultimately developed from my recent experience of uterine pathology. So in 2019, I was diagnosed with a large fibroid, which was, is essentially a benign tumorous growth of the uterus that is quite common in women of later reproductive age. And as you can gather from the slide, um, required surgical removement, removal to alleviate a range of associated symptoms. So essentially, I saw this as an opportunity to not only have tissue to isolate um, cells and immortalize them from the particular fibroid, but to also use the project as a mechanism to consider how creating alternative offspring from this tumorous mass might offer a sense of empowerment and a space for expressing and rethinking the often unspoken anguish of situational childlessness or potential infertility, which was something that I was really um, grappling with over a number of years and particularly during my diagnosis. So prior to having the tumour removed, I developed a series of preliminary works for a solo show titled Morning Story, Expectations, Absences and the Potentials for Self-Persistence. 
that aim to give some insight into my feelings of grief um, reflected in the sculptural works Memento Mori and coming to terms with being forgotten. Other works addressed problematic constructions of femininity and the legacy of hysteria in the treatment of female reproductive health, evident in the combined bleeding table and clock works, time is topological. On this slide, you can see an anatomical model with a snake representing the theory of the wandering womb, the belief that the uterus wanders about the body of a woman like a wild animal. And this condition is the condition that causes major illnesses in women, which was an accepted view documented in early medical texts from ancient Greece, including the Hippocratic corpus. The work SVKRLM Tumor Baby, in contrast, shifts from a sense of mourning and pain to a more hopeful stance as it alludes to the establishment of the cell line from the fibroid tissue. By incorporating a flask of fixed cells of mine established from another project and taxidermy butterflies as symbols for transformation, the work makes a direct link back to the work HEC293T, the transformation of Joni or Oliver, which you would have seen in one of the previous slides, signaling also the potential for the fibroid cells to not only establish a single cell line, but spawn a range of daughter cells that open themselves up to further becoming. On the slide, you can also see images of cells successfully isolated from my little tumour baby by project partners Brad Sutherland and Jo Marie Courtney from the School of Medicine. And thanks to ANAT, I will now be able to work with Brad and Jo Marie alongside Jane Nielsen from the Centre for Law and Genetics at UTAS and of course Dittmar from the Regenerative Medicine Group at QUT on hopefully establishing the second artist cell line for inclusion in the American Type Culture Collection or ATCC, which is the central global repository for cell lines. But more so, I'm also interested in using the process of establishing the cell line to highlight some of the troubling histories of cell culture and examine current legal and ethical frameworks for the management and use of biological materials across multiple terrains and contexts, creative, clinical and commercial, including consent, privacy, patent and IP considerations. But it's also very much a way for me to rethink the boundary of the body and self and to consider alternative notions of kinship and also how this might operate in a space that could be regarded as, again, my colleagues Oren Katz and Yonat Zer have observed as quite exploitative of life and the semi-living. So this begs the question, what are the ethical implications of developing alternative genetic offspring that exist as biological products in a research context? So I will leave it there in the interest of time. And I would just like to take a brief moment to acknowledge the many organizations and people that have supported the projects presented today. And thank you for your attention. And I will pass over to my esteemed colleague. Welcome. As said by our uh, moderator, it's really great to meet in person again after such a long time. But I also would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet today and pay my respect to the elders past and present. And I also extend my respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, which might be here today in person or maybe virtually. So, uh, can we have my clicker? Ah, I need to use the clicker, like a real conference. Okay, so first I have uh, this little disclaimer, which is quite important. Uh, I mean, you have heard from Svenja that some of our work has been commercialized um, and has been translated to the clinic. So, uh, yeah, as a scientist and, and uh, engineer, we work with outlines, as you can see here. So uh, I will talk a little bit uh, about my background and then uh, about our regenerative medicine projects. And then I will, uh, at the end, uh, spend some time on uh, the collaboration with Svenja, and uh, which I might term the convergence of art, creative industries in, into regenerative medicine. Um, 
which I think is a very important part. Uh, as I said before, my, my original training is, is engineering. Uh, then I did a, um, an MBA. I worked in industry for 10 years. Then uh, I decided that I don't want to spend the rest of my life in industry. And I decided to do a PhD in Singapore at NUS in the area of, of tissue engineering. Um, but I was always still very passionate uh, to bring in the, uh, the creative mind, because I think that's very important. And that's very often uh, not forgotten uh, with the engineers, but especially I think in the area of regenerative medicine, it's very important to get this creative stimulation, which then leads also to the ethical implications when you talked a little bit. And I think if you don't have this creative part, it will be very difficult to get to the ethics. Um, so I have to click. Yeah, but can you maybe uh, play the, the clip? So I'm a director also of an ARC uh, PhD training center. So it was great that you acknowledge the ARC, which is a great funding agency. And uh, that's where we do a lot of our work and um, related to, to 3D printing and then additive biomanufacturing. So over the years, uh, actually the center is now uh, coming to its end uh, after five years. So we had a couple of uh, also events. Uh, yeah, so this, can you click the other one, please? Uh, yeah, if you go back again, the video should come. Too much technology. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, but how do I see this one? I have to click this. Okay, come. Yeah, so we have been asked to a few times to participate in this uh, TV show, uh, which should normally come with me speaking, but maybe I can just talk to it. Uh, so again, this is where, where I explained that 3D printing uh, really is a major part uh, now in, in a lot of products uh, you are using and has come a, a very long way. And we are also using the 3D printing in the medical field. Um, but as when you are uh, mentioned, one of the, the big issues, uh, technically, firstly, is uh, that I have colleagues who talk about that we can print tissues and organ, which is completely wrong. Uh, and and uh, it's a little bit of my uh, passion to really uh, make this clear because you hear this over and over again. Because the important part is that if you say that you can print tissues and organs is that you completely neglect the biology. Because what we can do is we can print cells like the ones Svenja mentioned, which we are isolating in what we call a bio ink, which is a, is a spe specific biomaterial. So we can mix the cells into this bio ink and then we can print the bio ink with the cell. But that is not a tissue and this is not an organ. These are just cells, which again, and that's where we have the fantastic discussions between the artist and the scientist is a living object, but just a cell, but it's not a tissue. So it's very limited what the cell can do, right? Because a cell, uh, for example, cannot pump blood, right? For that you need a heart, an organ, which is composed of many cells and so on. 
So again, the, uh, this is very important, uh, I think. Um, then the other aspect, which is also quite important, uh, is, is this complexity. And this field of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine is now four decades old, one can say. And I had colleagues 20 years ago who promised by today we would have the tissue engineered heart, we would have the tissue engineered kidney, we would have the tissue engineered liver, which would be awesome. I would jumping over the roof if this would have happened. But unfortunately, to disappoint you, we are far away from this. We are far, far away from engineering an organ. Uh, but again, in the mainstream media, this is still unfortunately very, very often communicated that we can do this. Uh, and again, one of the ways I think to communicate this uh, to, to the society is, is together to work with artists and, and uh, make this clear, because if I would make this uh, quite technical, then I think the message would become more complex. So. This is already too far. Maybe I'm not going to play this. So, so I wanted to play you another video, um, which shows again uh, one of the patients we treated now two and a half years ago. So our scaffold technology for, for bone regeneration, where we 3D print scaffolds from biodegradable materials. But this is just the material. And then we bring in the biology uh, by sometimes using cells of the patient, but often growth factors, or by doing specific surgery. And I wanted to show you the, the clip where in collaboration with uh, Dr. Michael Wagels, who is a plastic surgeon at the PA, uh, in, a, in an interdisciplinary team, we treated a patient who had a bone infection of his uh, lower leg, and the surgeons had to cut out 37 centimeters of his tibia. And the patient was 26 years old. And basically, the decision was made that they had to amputate the leg and then put in a prosthesis. So that patient talked uh, to Dr. Vegas and he said, anything you can do for me, doc, I'm going with you. So Michael came to me and our team, and then we discussed if there would be a possibility with our technology to regenerate the bone. That patient today is walking again, but 70% of the bone is regenerated. Actually, he started walking again after, after 12 months, but it was a very complex process with a lot of engineering, with a lot of biology, with a lot of surgical planning. And that patient also had two other operations in between. Right, but we saved his leg. So, so that, is a, that is a reality, uh, but again, this is not by putting cells into a hydrogel printing and then saying, I have printed a bone. Uh, so, so as I said, this technology has been translated uh, and actually more than 50,000 patients, I think today uh, received the scaffolds but not all patients with this major defect, a lot of patients with uh, smaller defects. But we have translated this technology now also to another area, which again, uh, as I mentioned before, to save the leg of a 26 year old is something specific, which I think is very important uh, for uh, our team to have this in mind that we really can make a difference for a patient. But an even bigger area is now what we are targeting. And uh, Svenja also mentioned a little bit. So there's this area of, of breast reconstruction. And um, here you see an example. This silicon implants are implanted basically 10 implants around the world per minute, right? So a very large number. And unfortunately, they have a lot of uh, mid and long term complications, which you see here. There are not many, unfortunately, alternatives. And there is a, a, a very strange, I think, communication between the, the clinical teams, the patients, and then other stakeholders like the insurance companies, like the media in this field, and so on. 
uh, which obviously has a big psychological impact on, on, uh, on female patients. So we are tackling this problem, uh, therefore, not just from trying to develop a, a technology uh, or regeneration of the tissue, but also to bring in uh, more discussion about this communication and this relationship in this triangle with our uh, behavioral economics team, uh, which you see here, this is one of our publications where we really want to stimulate the discussion uh, about uh, because what we, what we see very often, even so, uh, and men uh, Svenja mentioned this also before, there's so much information out, right? So for example, if you go to the uh, Breast Cancer Foundation webpage, there's a lot of information, but the way the information for the patient to digest is very difficult. And then the communication with the surgeon, again, is very difficult, the communication with the family and so on. So we try to bring in uh, also from this aspect, uh, also some more, uh, First, the evidence that this is out there, and secondly, maybe some impact, how this can be changed. So, uh, again, what is quite disturbing then is uh, when you read this quote. Uh, so this surgeon already said in 1972, 1977, uh, that there is a significant problem with his implants, right? This is like 40 years ago. But today, as I said, a lot of these implants are still implanted on a daily basis. This technology has not changed, right? Which is, again, I think, uh, very disturbing. Um, so again, uh, I think we have to find a way to, to uh, do the communication towards uh, these changes, which again, if we just do the techno talk, is very difficult. Uh, because as I said before, uh, I can produce the best scaffold in the world. If I take the scaffold and I give this to a badly trained surgeon, the scaffold will not work, right? So for example, often what also we see with our technology is that the surgeons have to change their strategy in the preoperative planning in the surgery itself, and also in the post-surgery treatment. So this is, again, a very interdisciplinary approach. There are a lot of surgeons which are, you can say rightly or not rightly, as we are in other things, so much into their uh, concepts that they are not open to this. So again, one of the questions for us is, uh, how do we break this barrier of this communication? And again, I am very passionate about that. I think that. Uh, working from the creative side will break up that uh, barrier often because again if we do the technology talk we are not stimulating the right uh, mindset to maybe look into this change so when you mentioned uh, we have translated now this into the first patient and again uh, when you think about this patient uh, Young Caitlin uh, has been living with this for a long, long time. Had, I think, overall like 18 operations. Uh, and then decided to go on the journey with this uh, new treatment concept. And here you see also uh, Dr. Michael Wegels, who is uh, a surgeon of this generation. He's very, very open to be flexible in his mind to uh, go along with these new technologies and to implement those and so on. And especially also uh, from the psychological side uh, to really bring this passion in uh, for the patient. Oops. Okay. So now we come to the convergence. Uh, so as I said before, um, you know, I'm, I'm quite passionate about this. And actually one of my PhD students is in the audience and um, I also often have a, a, a artist in residence in my lab. And it's specifically the uh, students which come with the engineering and material science background. When the artists present, it's quite interesting to, to see the reflection. Uh, but then over time, when you see the discussion and how they work together and so on, this is, is I, I think, really rewarding. Uh, and unfortunately, this is not really quite embedded into the curricula, right? So, so if you study 
uh, at QUT Engineering or here at UQ. It's no difference. <laughs> Both universities or any university in Australia and many other countries are really not teaching this, right? Everybody talks about the interdisciplinarity, but uh, you know, the creative and art side is, is not something uh, which, which uh, is bridging over. Likewise, the other way around, I think, you know, from the art side, uh, I see sometimes I have to admit projects where, where artists talk about technology and they have very limited uh, knowledge, which, which is okay, but, but uh, are not really willing then also uh, to learn more. And they come up with postulations which they link to the art, where the technology side really doesn't fit in. So I think we, we really uh, have to collaborate and work together. Um, and, and this is an, uh, actually an article related to regenerative medicine, which uh, is, is addressing this, right? And when we think about regeneration, uh, again, from the technology side, I, I can make very beautiful scaffolds. You know, I can do a lot of measurements, testing up and down and so on. Uh, but next to, if I give this to a surgeon who is not very well trained, right? So now I have a great scaffold. Now I have a surgeon who is very well trained. But now I have a patient who is super skeptical about what we are doing, right? I think if you would do a clinical trial, and I hope we never do this, to compare patients which are uh, very, very skeptical and patients which are really uh, open and willing, because I think that the patient itself has such a big impact that even a great technology and actually, we can see this uh, with implants like a hip prosthesis or a knee prosthesis or in the cardiovascular field. Again, these are implants which have a very high standard. So there's a large group of, of patients, for example, who live now with their hip implants for more than 25 years. But there are also a small number of patients where the implants go out after a couple of years. And that's related to also the... Uh, the positivity, maybe uh, you could call it of the patient uh, in respect and not about the, the technology itself. So again, in this article, this is, this is raised. Uh, I mean, the other things about uh, regeneration, which again, when you're linked is rejuvenation. We want to live longer and longer, right? Again, you also all know the statistics when the uh, health minister comes up and then it is discussed that our life expectancy has been extended in Australia for another three years, right? But how many people ask how well, with how much happiness this extended years have been with the patient, right? And there are some other stunning figures. Uh, again, this comes from health economics. If you think about the last two or three years of your life, 80 to 90% of the health costs in your lifespan are coming then together, right? So these are all things I think we, we have to consider. And again, I give you now the, uh, the figures, but is that really something which sets with you, which stimulates your mindset and so on. I'm not sure. I think more of the things maybe uh, Svenja talked about when you go into an exhibition, stimulate maybe uh, more your mindset that, that you are more aware about this and then you think more about uh, also your own uh, health, your own lifetime. Uh, and when you then see the doctors for the treatments in the, in the future, that you make decisions uh, which come not just from the technology and, and, and again, the data, right? Um, and this is related here in this article also, you know, you can go back to the, to the Greek philosophers um, that they already talked about, obviously the, the combination of the body and the mind. But very often again, uh, when I go to regenerative medicine conferences, this is not a topic. And, and I can tell you uh, if, if, uh, and I think I have never done this, maybe one day I will have the, the guts to do it. To talk like I talk here, I am sure that a lot of my colleagues 
you know, would be not interested in the topic. <laughs> uh, okay, so again, uh, for myself, I, I was very inspired uh, by the young lady next to me, because uh, here you see uh, a copy of a, of a dissertation, the front page, uh, because she did the PhD, not with me, but in, in, in the institute, I was also with my group and, and uh, that's how it all started, uh, this inspiration for, for both sides. Um, and Svenja already talked a little bit about the, the exhibitions we did uh, and they have been, again, very stimulating also for my team because a lot of team members, as you have heard, have been uh, involved. And again, it was quite interesting to see the change because at the beginning, they were used more for the technical side. But then as they discussed more and more what uh, Svenja had in mind, you could really see how uh, it was working in them and how their creativity uh, got stimulated in that process. And that's something we want to continue with this new project. Uh, it has been a journey, uh, not just, uh, well, how to put it? I mean, the Australian Research Council is a great funder, but we all know uh, often we miss out on funding uh, and, and uh, we, we are not successful with the grants. So also for us, it was a journey. Uh, overall, I think very successful, but obviously to do the work, we, we need uh, some financial backing. Uh, and it's great that we got this new grant uh, that we can continue this journey. And uh, I stop here. I hope we have time for questions. I thank you for, for listening. And if you want to get a little bit more tech information, a mixture of tech information and, and interdisciplinarity, you can also listen to my TED talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, fantastic. So um, I think we can we can do questions sitting on our, our chairs here now. So we have like 25 minutes um, for questions now. Um, and we will take questions both from the room here and from the Zoom room as well. So Grayson will um, moderate those too. And is the microphone for the audience? I think so. Okay. So we have, oh yeah, maybe we can ask. Uh, so, Johnny, you're going to be our, our microphone person? Is that have you just been? <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so now and then, so we will have questions for 25 minutes in the room and um, and online, um, and then we will invite you to join us for a drink and some informal um, discussion after that. So, I'm going to throw it open to the room now. I think I can see everyone. No one's hidden behind a poll that I can't see. Um, so, who would like to kick us off? Yes, Warwick, is that you waving your hand there? Jump in. Uh, I'm um, very interested in your uh, idea of immortality and, and cells. Um, and uh, I, in my particular line, I, I've kind of uh, thought about that, that very issue. And I was wondering how you, um, if you'd like to sort of develop a little, you know, briefly, how you actually understand immortality, because it obviously has a uh, particular uh, philosophical and religious uh, connotations, and uh, which don't seem to line up with uh, a materialist science. And uh, yet one feels that there's something like that needed in the thinking that's required in your transhumanist approach. And um, the thing that I didn't quite get, I might have missed it at the beginning, was that uh, if something is immortal, then obviously then it's not, not mortal. And mortality relates to death. Something lives and then dies. And so I'm just wondering whether the idea of death is of issue with you in your work and whether the, the fact that, that you're working under the sign of immortality in the proliferation of shell of, of, of certain kinds of cells, whether the uh, the fact of death that happens, I guess, in the cells, uh, is something that you that you're trying to develop to transcend, and if so, if you're trying to transcend it, 
into immortality, from mortality, then in some sense, then, you know, is that genuine immortality or is it something like quasi-immortality that's just simply more life? Uh, so thanks for your question. And I guess I'd really like to declare that I'm not a transhumanist at all. <laughs> I'm actually really, you know, I don't think that this idea of immortality is really useful. And so part of it that I want to use the project for is to actually sort of explore my own rela relationship to the idea and particularly, you know, coming, for me, it's been very much an exploration of recognizing my own, mortal my own mortality and kind of going, well, if I don't have children, what am I gonna leave behind? And that's been very much this consideration. And so that sort of sparked this idea, well, maybe instead of having children, I could have an alternative legacy. But I also think even in just constructing cell lines, there's a futility in it because part of me goes, do I really think that the cell lines are going to be really immortal? I don't think so, because I don't think that even if you, and Dittmar would be able to talk more to this, but I think if you actually cultured a cell line for ongoing, which I don't think many people have really done for a really long time in a considered way, but I don't think that the cells would actually prove to be immortal. I think that there is a finitude to all life. And also in one of the works that you would have seen there, the coming to terms with being forgotten is really a way for me to sort of think about, well, the idea is sort of ridiculous because even this idea of having a portion of DNA that represents me, I think is um, really silly because I also kind of go, we're part of a huge continuum that we're connected into deep time. And so we're really just a tiny little part of an ongoing legacy. And so if part of me is grappling with this recognition that goes back to more of a post-human view rather than a transhumanist view, that we're all kind of connected into this long history, that we're all part of something. So why is it important to have this immortality? Why is it important? And for me, it's that kind of question because as much as I recognize that it isn't really important because I'm already you know, immortal if I think of the fact that I'm already connected into this huge history of life that spans beyond myself into other creatures. But at the same time, there's this weird part of me that's really sad at this idea that I don't have anything tangible that I can leave behind. And so I guess that's part of um, what the project is about, is about grappling with these ideas. But definitely I'm not trying to create some kind of um, immortal legacy because I really don't believe that, that that's possible. So I'm really um, coming at from, you know, trying to use this as a provocation to really look at what is this desire for immortality? Why is it still so persistent, you know? And how do we actually let go of that? Because I think that um, it's really problematic also when we start to see ourselves as somehow separate from, um, from other organisms, from nature, et cetera. So I hope that that sort of answers more where I'm coming from. Deepma, did you want to speak to that as well? Well, yeah, with the, with the cell line, you know, um, again, a cell is just a cell. And, mm. and if you would culture it endlessly, there are, I mean, billions of cells which are dying, right? So when I showed you, you can order this, right? And then you get a million cells into the lab, you do an expansion. But, but then all the cells die and a few survive and, and, and so on. So, so uh, it's just a technical term, mm. you know, uh, yeah. And again, the philosophical part, I think Svenja explained very well, which is important. But again, there are a lot of scientists which don't think in this direction and they think and they make this connection between these immortalities, which mm. is obviously uh, debatable. Yeah, I think people hear phrases like immortal cell lines and it's such a resonant, evocative concept that the, the kind of a general public sort of response to that is to, to understand it in a very different way than you've just explained, Dietma. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and maybe also then the other, other link uh, is more to the stem cell. I, say, I think maybe that's also the one uh, when we talk about immortality and, and regeneration, right? Um, that the stem cell and this cell uh, we all originate from. And if we find out what this stem cell does, then we can recreate humans and so on, mm. right? So I think for me, this is a, a very simplistic view, again, forgetting this very complexity, which leads to that I'm sitting here, that I'm 57 years old, 
and over the 57, five years, billions of billions of cells have been died and new ones have been produced and so on. And uh, this is beyond any complexity, uh, I think we can imagine. And if there are scientists who come and there are some uh, very smart scientists, which puts this in very, very intelligent words to try to explain to you that this is possible. I just like you to be skeptical and <laughs> learn a little bit more about this complexity. I'm just going to quickly ask a, a question from online. Uh, this just comes from Alexa and it's for Svenja. And she asks, how does she see her offspring represented in the future? That's a question that I just can't answer. And I think that what's really exciting about working with a team like Ditmar is that we sort of come in a lot of the time with a particular proposition. But then the nice thing about having an ANAC grant is that you don't, that it is open to the collaboration resulting and moving in a really radically different direction. And I think that, so I can't say how I would see the, it, it originating. I also kind of go, the cells that were frozen down, there were a few vials that had an infection. And so part of me is also even going, they might not be viable. And so there's always that kind of thing where you just really don't know. And I think, but at least we've sort of got the capacity now to sort of start that exploration and allow for an input from all of the different um, team members. And we have team members from um, science, but also from law. And I think that that's going to be really interesting to be able to bring all of that together and to kind of think about, well, where do we want to go with this project? So sorry, I can't give an answer to something there. And we had a question in the room, Karen, here. Hello. So um, that actually, my question actually follows on a little bit from that. Uh, thank you both for really uh, inspiring and thoughtful talks. So I'd like to bring you back a little bit to um, the kind of ethical implications of, 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 of the work you're doing. And the, uh, especially Svenja, you, you mentioned very briefly uh, kind of working with the, the legal, cultural and social barriers to the, to, to the kind of uh, research work you do. And uh, especially considering that you've been working on ideas of contagion and ideas of uh, replicating your DNA through, through viruses. I, I would be really interested to hear if, um, um, I mean, you mentioned that your project started before the COVID period. Um, has it changed throughout this period? Will you have to find a new way to, 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 to think this type of, uh, this type of regeneration, uh, considering the, the changes in this area? Uh, I don't think that I would really need to change it. I think it becomes much more visceral for people if you encountered the work now after having COVID you know, come through. But I think, I mean, there's nothing dangerous about the work as well. And I think it just immediately highlights a lot of these, you know, the fears that we have, particularly with COVID. But then I also kind of go, part of me is curious to see what COVID will bring in the long term future. Because, you know, I think that we're only privy to, you know, this short time span in our own lives. And I just don't like, part of me is a bit curious of kind of going, well, what particular traits do we inherit from having these infections in the way that you have ancestral infections? And we just don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I would probably be very cautious in the way that I'm couching things. And, you know, even with the exhibition, it was really clear for people that did feel uncomfortable that there was no danger, you know, that we had a risk, um, sort of, we'd done a risk assessment. There was clear a out, clear outline of what was done to make sure that it was safe. Um, and anyone that's worked in a museum or a gallery environment knows that if there's gonna be anything that's, you know, you're gonna get sprayed with, it's probably been autoclave, like sterilized, and it's gonna be cleaner than tap water for you to get it into a public, um, a public space. So I don't think it would really um, shift too much unless I think that I got feedback from people that they were really distressed by anything that I was presenting. And then it's part of a discussion because I'm not trying to be, you know, when I say I'm trying to be provocative, yes, I want people to kind of be kind of listen up so that they kind of start to ask questions and think, but I also don't want to be causing unnecessary distress, um, distress to people. And I think that's part of the conversation. 
we do have another question from online. Um, this is a question that both of our um, presenters may be able to reflect on. They're asking about the difference between transhuman and posthuman as, for example, something, um, the difference between a person with a 3D printed arm and a person with a heart transplant. So maybe you could reflect on transhuman, posthuman, and these different forms of kind of, um, yes, body printing or, or medical process. So I'm happy to talk to, I'll leave Dittmar with the, the regenerative medicine more question, but I think with the transhumanist versus posthumanist positioning, you know, my viewpoint is that, you know, the, the transhumanist would be people like I mentioned, you know, Ray Kurzweil, and there's very much this kind of emphasis on human superiority, superiority, technological superiority, um, this kind of, again, you know, privileging of the human. And, um, you know, looking a lot at technology as being able to afford, you know, this, this great status where you kind of, you know, evolve beyond human through technology. And I think the post-human position, you know, is really, really different to that. And so I often sort of draw on a lot of feminist post-humanists that are really looking very much at radically kind of rethinking the human and actually looking at more that we're actually connected on a more level, you know, field with other organisms so that when we're trying to, you know, take the human down from this pedestal and recognise that we're actually all animals, we're part of a lineage, we're part of a kind of system of kinship, we're made up of a range of, you know, interspecies connections, we're connected to nature. So it's a really radically different kind of positioning. But again, there isn't that kind of rejection of technology in that thinking, but rather a recognition that, you know, culture and technology aren't opposites, but that, that they're really fundamental interconnected. So I think that would be how I would um, answer the question of transhumanist versus posthumanist, which are very, very different um, positionings. And then the other question was around the... Yeah. So, so again, we cannot 3D print an arm, right? Uh, we can uh, 3D print materials, which uh, maybe have some functions, but this would be material, not, not living matter, right? So you shouldn't compare this to a transplanted heart, right? Uh, so a transplanted heart obviously is a heart which you get from another person. And, and I can, can see, uh, and again, when you read the reports, obviously there is a, is a big psychological issue for the patients, right? Uh, in that sense. Um, but then again, being more, more technical, the, the things we do, like when we regenerate the, the bone, the scaffold is made from what we call a biodegradable polymer. So it's the same polymer if you uh, would have a kitchen accident and you would have a large wound and you would go to your GP, he would stitch you up. And then he would say, ah, oh, when do I have to see you again that you pull out the stitches? He said, ah, oh, you don't need to come back because the stitches resolve. So we use very similar materials uh, in our scaffolds. So the way it works is that the scaffold is there for a certain period of time anything between two and four years to guide this uh, tissue formation and this remodeling. And then the scaffold degrades and it's, it's then completely gone. Technically, it's, it's uh, going into the crap cycle and uh, I stop here technically. Okay, so, so it's all gone. Uh, so nothing left from what we implanted uh, from the material side. Um, we sometimes also implant the scaffold in combination with cells. And there again, we, we have now two options. Either we can take your cells, so we could go to, for example, to your bone marrow or, or to your adipose tissue and then isolate cells and then combine them with the scaffold. So this would be your own cells. Having said that, there would be a lot of manipulation in the lab, right? With cell culture media and, 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 and so on. Or uh, there is something which is called allogenic. So, so we could uh, take cells from uh, another donor and that would be then used. Uh, but what we also know from today, from these experiments, all the cells we explant, they, they all die in a certain period of time. Actually, a lot of them die in the first couple of, of, of days, right? Uh, and then there is uh, this interaction with uh, your own body, and then your own body is, is, is doing this replacement, right? So I actually don't see this uh, connection to post or transhuman in, in that case. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Correct. Thank you. I can see we have a question at the back as well. 
Thanks for the talk, both of you. Um, I think the two questions are we talk about regenerative medicine and we're talking people like more individual level, but we are now facing like climate change and running out of mineral resources. Do you see like um, opportunities there for more sustainable, um, yeah, more sustainable way to treat patients in the, in the future? And can we promote this more? Mm. No, because, you know, no, because there's, there's also no, no, I mean, I think uh, maybe what you want to get it, it, it is a science. Yes, there is a field of environmental science where uh, biodegradable polymers are used. So from a material science point of view, we use very similar materials. But just to give you uh, one major difference, the, uh, the, the workhorse polymer we use is name is polycaprolactone. <laughs> yeah, it's a, sorry, I have to be a little bit technical. It's an aliphatic polyester and so on, right? Uh, and this polymer is also used in a lot of biodegradable uh, environmental materials now in cups, in, in bags, and so on. But the difference is the polymer we use for our implants, one kilogram costs between six to $8,000, right? So you would never make a coffee cup which weighs five or six grams out of a polymer, which uh, costs this money, right? Uh, this wouldn't be sustainable. But you can produce this polymer uh, as a non-medical grade uh, material for, uh, we can buy this for, for $20, right? So, so there is an overlap of the material science, which I think uh, is important. Uh, but in respect to uh, the, the treatment, no. no. And, and one has to admit, uh, you know, that the things we do here at the moment, this is really, really expensive, right? Uh, again, for, I mean, it's very easy for me to say here, oh, my team and I, we worked on this like three or four of us, it was three months, right? Uh, if you would at the commercial value of just the manpower we would put in, right? This couldn't be done for every patient at the moment. So, uh, but that's how the cutting edge science works. And so the next step is to break this down that we are quicker, faster, and, and so on. But at the moment, this is really a, a high-tech uh, technology and it's only for a limited amount of, of patients. Friends, we are almost out of time, so I think we will make this the last question. Yeah. Uh, hi. Okay. Oh, yes. Thank you for, gosh, it's such a big topic. We could go on forever, but I was really interested to ask each of you or both of you, um, what brought you or what is it that you like about the other person's discipline? I mean, that's kind of what we were talking about here. Because my little bit of experience of working with scientists as an artist is that scientists don't really get how artists think. And I don't know if it works the other way too, but I was taken by Dieter's comment that um, his colleagues wouldn't like to really hear him talk about this and I don't wasn't sure if it was because they didn't want to hear about the ethics or the creativity but you had said that you thought the creativity in the in the arts helped you to translate the science and that's my question yeah what brought you to embrace transdisciplinarity mm -hmm. across such supposedly I mean, I started working in art and science because I just really wanted to grow mutants and I came in <laughs> to the lab. So I was exactly one of the, um, the artists that Dietmar was talking about with a really limited understanding of biology. And I spoke to my then supervisor and I was like, I just want to grow a mutant. And she was like, okay, let me come in, come in, have a look at the cells, what we're doing and the tissue. And I, it didn't click at that moment that from this little bit of cells on the base of a flask, that it would be really tricky to actually produce bio mutant. 
if you since you can't even create organs yet you know that have all of the complexity of living tissue and so for me it was really um, important for me coming in to challenge a lot of my assumptions that I was making about scientists and I think that it was also really great for the team that I was working with to challenge the assumptions that they were making about artists and I mean when I say I was trying to make a mutant there was more behind it it wasn't just a frivolous idea but initially you know it took a while my my supervisor at the time Z Upton she was really open to it because she really saw the the value in being able to introduce someone who had such a really wrong idea of biology to actually integrate them show them so that you could really understand the other positioning and that worked really well vice versa and it was sort of building trust over time, you know, learning the language so that you have the ability to be able to um, talk across, across boundaries. But I also think it is about a rapport. And I was talking to Elizabeth earlier and going, you can't just randomly smush together an artist and a scientist and go, go forth and make art science work. It doesn't really work like that. There is also a kind of, yeah, rapport that you need to have a, an openness as Ditma was also suggesting, you know, to surgeons, you know, part of me goes, I think you need an openness as an artist to really value not only the scientific insights, but also the creative insights that they can bring to a project and vice versa. And I think that that's certainly something that I found with Ditmar is just a willingness to, to listen, to be open, to have a laugh as well, you know, sometimes where, you know, either one of our suggestions might be really ridiculous, but we kind of can laugh about it. We can hold different viewpoints and allow them to occupy, you know, the same territory without, you know, saying one's right and one's wrong. We might disagree, but that's okay. And it's okay to, to bring in disagreement into the work as well. And I think that that makes it richer. And again, that's something that, you know, has built up over a number of years as well. So it, it's not instantaneous. And I think that that's sometimes a bit of misnomer around that you can just do that instantly. You know, particularly in universities, they go, we'll give you money and then in six months we want a grant output. And I'm going, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow, well, not much to add. Uh, maybe the, the other thing to add is, uh, you know, there needs to be chemistry also, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what you said at the end, right? Uh, because again, everybody talks about interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity. And it's not just between the artist and the, the scientist, you mentioned the, the surgeon and so on, right? But we are all humans. We are, we are this uh, complex living uh, system. And, and again, uh, if there is no chemistry, between the team or, or the, uh, the one who uh, should collaborate, uh, which is, again, Svenja said, you, means also, you know, there is friction, there is discussion, there is disagreement and so on, right? Uh, then this will not work. And, and I think that's very important. Uh, but then in the bigger picture, I think it's, it's really important to, to create this environment, right? So, for example, in my lab, right? Yes, it is in a way a top down, right? So I make the decision to bring in the artist and, and then I say, we work now together, but I, I already communicated with the artist, right? So, so my, my students and my postdocs, they are exposed. I mean, I give them also the freedom to go out, but mostly they don't do it, right? But then when the artist is in the team, then, then, then things uh, get rolling. So uh, yeah. And, and coming back to my colleagues, uh, yeah, a lot of them are not inspired by this, which is very strange for me, right? Uh, I was always inspired by, by art, by poetry and so on. Uh, and again, I, I think this is something also which the bigger picture is missing in the science curriculum, right? Uh, I think actually on this note, we go into the wrong direction with the STEM field. Right, it's so streamlined now to take the arts completely out, you know, uh, and, and I think we will regret this in the next 20 years because we, we will have people uh, which are really in this block thinking and, and will miss out on, on a lot of what makes art. Uh, you know, the, the Greeks would say a complete human. Seems like a very inspiring night now to bring the full.
proceedings of this evening um, to a close. So I think at this point we will say farewell to our online friends who are joining us. I don't know if there was anything you wanted to say. No, there are no more that. questions. Okay, um, so we will just say thank you to our online friends um, who joined us tonight and, and who shared their questions. And please join me in thanking our two wonderful speakers for this evening. to an end this evening we'd like to invite you to join us for some informal chat to over a nice uh, drink and some canapes in the um, reception area so those of you who know the way can lead on and uh, and then we will continue the conversation there thank you so much for your questions everyone Good work. yeah team member <laughs> so, so wonderful